So our next two speakers will be sharing their insights on robots, work and intimacy. So please um, make welcome uh, Professor Peter Corp to the stage. Thank you. Danielle. All right, so it falls to me as the robot guy to talk about jobs. Uh, whenever I give a talk about robotics, and I give lots of talks about robotics, people always ask me about jobs. Who here has seen a headline or a newspaper article with some words like this in it? Most people in the room? This is a meme that just goes around and around and around. We can't kill it. Uh, we don't know if it's true and we don't know if it's false. And I want to just talk about, talk about this a bit uh, and give some, some perspectives on it. I think the reason that it, that it worries us, uh, these, these words, is it conjures up images like this, you know, depression era, you know, huge social, huge social disruption, people, uh, people out, of, out of employment, not able to feed their families. You know, if you've got a large number of uh, unemployed people in society, then social unrest can, can follow, revolution can follow, right? There's historical precedent for that. So I think when we see those headlines, images like this light up in our heads and we worry. And I think we, we probably consider that it's perhaps people like this, tradespeople, uh, blue collar workers that are gonna be first up against the wall when this happens. And that we who've been to university with our higher skills, our wonderful uh, abilities in pattern recognition, natural language processing, knowledge organization, we the highly trained professional ones are going to be immune. I think it's exactly the opposite. Uh, I think it's people with these skills who are, are really at in most danger. And the reason is that those things that I've listed down the bottom, what we think of as human exceptionalism, people have been chipping away at these sets of capabilities uh, for a very long time. So artificial intelligence as a field was defined more than 60 years ago. Uh, it came from what was called the Summer Research Project back in 1956. A bunch of smart people got together at Dartmouth College and uh, thought that they'd nail this, this problem in the summer. Uh, there are lots of problems in engineering, computer science, that we thought we were going to nail in a summer and still have not. Uh, but, you know, they were looking at things like natural language processing, uh, creativity even. Robotics wasn't on their agenda. Robots didn't get actually invented probably until two years after these guys had, had their meeting. So this is the agenda of the uh, artificial intelligence community. And it's had some stunning achievements. So, you know, activities that we think of as, you know, the pinnacle of human intellectual endeavor, the game of chess. Uh, computers beat human ch chess grandmasters more than 20 years ago. Uh, last year, famously, computers beat uh, the world uh, champion Lee Sado at the Asian game of Go, which is far more complex than the game of chess, actually. So those things that we think of as uniquely human, pinnacles of, of intellectual achievement, computers can do that. There's some recent results from what we call image captioning. So I can show a computer a picture and it can write me a bit of text that describes what's going on inside that picture. It's a capability that five years ago we, we had no clue about how to do that. And we've gone on in leaps and bounds. We can recognize not just the objects in the scene, but the relationships between those objects and the activities and actions uh, within, within those images. And this stuff's now becoming commercial. So, you know, Amazon, you can have a little microphone-y thing in your house and you can get it from Google, you can get it from Amazon, you can just talk to it and it'll, it'll do your bidding. Uh, that's a commodity, it costs you a few hundred bucks. It's taken 60 years of artificial intelligence research to get there, but now we're there. Uh, example from Google, uh, this is my Google Photos and I type in ships and up comes all the pictures of ships. So I search now, I can search pictures using words, which is really, really powerful because uh, I've got a stupid number of photos and they're all very disorganized, so this is really helpful. We know now that there are a number of companies have tech that allows the writing of short, uh, I won't use the word journalism, short articles that uh, go online or in newspapers, so short financial reports, short sports reports are written by algorithms based on data feeds, right? So no human beings are involved in this, right? Humans read them, uh, but AIs are writing these kinds of articles. And then we have robots, and a couple of examples of robots, traditional manufacturing robots on the left, and robots in uh, an Amazon fulfillment center on the right-hand side. Amazon own, we estimate, well over 100,000 robots, biggest robot fleet on the planet, enables Amazon to do what they did. 
They didn't have robots moving shelves of product around their warehouses. They couldn't compete. Uh, so totally an IT and robotics business that sells stuff. They're foremost a tech company, uh, second, a retail, second a retail company. So I want to make a distinction between AI and robotics. AI is the oldest field, artificial intelligence, about manipulating information, bits and bytes inside of a computer, uh, whether they're pictures or voice, uh, voice signals or whatever. Robots are things that manipulate physical objects in the physical world. And that's the difference. A lot of robots use AI, so you can think of a robot as an AI that does physical work. But a lot of the, uh, I think the coming, the job destruction that has happened and will come is going to come from AI. It's an easier problem because you're manipulating information inside a computer. It's frictionless. Where in the real world, you've got to deal with horrible things like you know, odd shaped objects and picking things up, which is hard. We can't build hands yet. We can't build very good eyes yet. So dealing with information inside a computer is a whole lot easier. Let me think of Moravec's paradox, and that is things that are easy for machines are hard for humans. Game of chess is a good example. Humans find chess very hard, machines find chess very easy. But the kid on the right who's picking up a chess piece, still almost impossible for a robot to do that. It might, not sound, might not sound reasonable, but it is the case. For the child who can recognize the piece, reach in with wonderful hand-eye coordination and pick up that chess piece, still cutting edge robotics problem. So, very easy for a human, even a very young human, very, very hard for machines. So I think it's useful to make a distinction between work and labor. Uh, work is the stuff that we want to do. Uh, and you know, the Greeks, I think, had this down right. The, the work is what they'd like to do. Perhaps it's designing lovely buildings, engaging in learned debate with your colleagues. And labor is the pesky stuff that needs to be done in order that society functions. And the Greeks had a solution to this dichotomy. If you're rich enough, you had slaves, right? And the slaves did the labor and you could do the work. You could uh, go and write your speeches and, and tell them to, to, to your colleagues. Human beings don't like labor. Uh, many of us like the work. It's what makes us get up in the morning. That's the labor we're not too keen on. So for the longest time then, we've tried to get other people to do labor for us. Uh, might be beasts, uh, harnessing wind and water power. Uh, and then we invented steam, uh, and that was wonderful. Lots and lots of labor could be done by steam-powered machines. You've probably got a sense that over many decades, centuries, the types of technologies that, we, that humans have created have come and gone. And I just want to run you really quickly through, through some changes, perhaps to give you sort of a more visceral impression of how much stuff has changed over time. So perhaps once upon a time, if you want music in your house, you had a piano and someone could sing, right? And that was it. Uh, sometime later, you might have a radio set in your house and it was powered by radio tubes or valves. And then you know, that technology was replaced by semiconductors, by transistors, and then it turned into a phone uh, connected to a speaker, right? But along the way, there were huge technology, huge industries built up to manufacture pianos or radio sets or vacuum tubes, right? Those, those jobs don't exist, right? It's not a, a null job description today. Another example. Uh, getting a message from one place to another was hard work. People on horses right, writing physical messages across the landscape. And then came telegraph. And then came instant messaging. So all the people who looked after horses and fed them and shod them and stabled them and made horseshoes or ran wires across the country or did Morse code keying were gone. Telephones, initially, quite a simple machine. Human beings had to connect a caller to the, to the callee. Uh, lots of people involved in installing phone boxes and wires and telephones in people's houses. Uh, then came rotary dialing and then later tone dialing. They all end up at the same place, right? It's the same device. Uh, what happened to all of these people? Uh, coal delivery men, chimney sweeps, gas, gas lamp lighters, all gone. Uh, replaced by electric, uh, electric lamps and, and electric wires. Cars, a this is a technology that was adapted incredibly quickly. And some of you might have seen this slide before. I, uh, I lifted it from Tony Sieber. In the 1900 in New York, say, where's the car? Amongst all those horse-drawn carriages, there's one. 1913, where's the horse, right? In, in a decade, total turnaround in technology of choice. 
And so what happened to all the people who scooped the poop and made the horseshoes and the stables and cut the hay and delivered it to the cities? All gone. Books, laboriously copied by monks once upon a time. Uh, and then the printing press and books became ubiquitous. And that was wonderful because it disseminated knowledge very, very widely. Uh, and now it's a device. Shopping, once upon a time, big department stores. Now it's an app and uh, stuff comes in a box. Banks, from tellers to kiosks. Airports, from checking people to kiosks. Supermarkets to kiosks or Amazon's view of the world, you just take stuff off the shelf and walk out and get billed for it. Uh, so huge change in not a, lot, a, a long period of time. Computers, once upon a time, uh, big complicated machines. And this guy sitting in the front, he's a computer operator. Don't have computer operators anymore. It sounds kind of mad, but used to have them and they've been replaced by operating systems. So you, we automated that. We wrote a program to do the job that the computer operator did. Typing, once upon a time, typing pools. I think Susie made a mention of uh, typing pools before. Uh, replaced by word processors uh, of a certain vintage, and now it's just an app that a kid can use uh, on a tablet. But there were huge industries involved in building typewriters. It was the Underwood factory, the largest typewriter factory in the world, because uh, people have all gone. Manufacturing, uh, again, once upon a time, very labor intensive, uh, now largely done by robots. Not entirely by robots, but largely by robots. Agriculture. Interesting graph. Agriculture is a, is a sector that's been hit really by three technological waves, right? Increase, uh, improved genetics, mechanization, and herbicides and pesticides. And so the percentage of people, this is from the US, involved in, in producing food has gone from 90 something percent to less to around 2% of the population. People aren't starving. People are probably still overfed, right? Uh, but using a far smaller fraction of the workforce to do this. So we have this paradox, right? New technologies replace old ones, and there are I've given you some examples, but there are hundreds more. Old industries just completely disappear. Yet today, more people are working than they ever did before. But now we've got machines that we can buy a machine that will do labor uh, for without a salary. It's, it's a one-off cost, and maybe you can depreciate it on your tax. So is this a manifest change in the, tech, in the technology? Is this change going to be different to all the changes that happened before? And I think that's the open question. We don't have an answer to that. Uh, we've never, human beings have never ever existed in an environment where labor cost effectively nothing. All of, our, all of the history of humanity, we've struggled to do work and find enough, enough food to put on the table. Is this time different? And I don't have an answer to that. If you look at what's common to uh, many of the endpoints of the, the various stories that I've shown you before, it's computer technology. And um, what drives this is phenomenal increase in computing power over time. You've probably heard of Moore's Law. Every 18 months or so, computing power doubles. And it's like a, a sort of hockey stick curve. It's gone along quite slowly for a while, and now it's at a point where uh, we can really see the exponential curve that we're on, uh, and we've got uh, a huge amount of computing power, amazing algorithms. It's, it's really changing uh, what we do. So I'm going to sort of lump all of those stories together into, into, th into three categories. One's manufacturing. And in manufacturing, we needed human beings to do manufacturing because they have superior ability to manipulate physical objects. And they've got superior hand-eye coordination to machines and then robots that came after the machines. There's still some things that humans could do better. Uh, robots are still not good at physical manipulation, and they're still not very good at hand-eye coordination. So while the machines have that inadequacy, we need humans to come in and bridge that gap. Because the robots are getting smarter over time, so the competitive advantage of human beings becomes less. We also have alternative ways of manufacturing things. Instead of assembling lots of little things together, which is fiddly, uh, we can just mill it or 3D print it. So the fabrication technologies have also uh, come to play here and eroded the natural competitive advantage of the human being. Service. We needed human beings in service roles, I think really because of their superior skills for interacting with people. Uh, 
and I think we're starting to, to tolerate, but perhaps not love, alternative ways of interacting with information systems through kiosks or voice menus. Uh, uh, I think human beings deep down hanker to talk to another human being about the problem. Maybe chatbots will evolve and become really awesome. At the moment, I think they're just tiresome. Here's the other one, the other class of jobs uh, are operators. And we needed operators because the machines uh, were dumb. The machines were just made of metal back in the day. They weren't very capable, they weren't intelligent, so they needed the machine, which had the strength, accuracy if you like, plus the human intelligence to get a thing done. And so there are examples of a, a, you know, a typewriter operator or a lift operator or a Morse code key operator. We needed human beings to augment the machines. I'll talk a little bit more about operators, but a particular class of operator is a vehicle operator. Uh, these people, I think, are in a very precarious position at the moment. There are a lot of jobs on the planet that involve people driving machines around, uh, either taxis, trucks, forklifts, or whatever. And there's a, a graph that I, I lifted, uh, which shows the most common job in each state of the US over a period of a few decades. If I run this animation, and this is just the top job in each, in each state, right? And you see that it changes uh, over, over time. Secretarial work fades out, farming work fades out, industrial work tends to fade out in some parts of the country. And increasingly, the most common job in each state ends up being truck driver. Uh, uh, I don't know, I can't vouch for the validity of, the, of, this, of this graph, but I think it's, uh, it's fascinating as people are pushed out of perhaps sales roles, perhaps pushed out of manufacturing roles, uh, pushed out of retail roles, uh, a lot of people are winding up in transport op occupations. And transport is what's in the, in, in the spotlight. Silicon Valley investors in uh, self-driving car companies, self-driving truck companies. Uh, there's a lot of money going after self-driving because uh, it's a really big sector of the economy. There are huge wins to be made there. So this is a, the next class of machine operators uh, that I think are in, in, in real strife. So I've given you some uh, some examples of jobs that are, that are gone and jobs that I think that are, that are in the line to, to go next. Should we be, should we be cheerful? Uh, I think the end of, the end of labor, uh, not work, but the end of labor is probably a good thing. It frees us up to do uh, what it is that we really want to do rather than shucking around doing hard physical labor. But there may be a lot of people who perhaps not so, not so motivated, there wasn't physical, physical labor to be done, perhaps they would be uh, unhappy, bored, restless, which is not good. Uh, so I think that's mixed, the end, of, the end of labor. A lot of literature says that there are a bunch of skills that are likely to be future-proof. Uh, the first one of those are the creators of the technology, uh, will be the last ones to go. Uh, so skills in engineering, coding, maths, big data. Uh, it's got, uh, I think, a strong future. Creative intelligence is a thing that I think all human beings delight in, are wonderful things created by other human beings, be it art, music, poetry, uh, designs, jokes. Uh, these are the things that are essential to us being human. Uh, and I think these are going to be very hard to, hard to replace. And I think also the softer human skills, negotiation, persuasion, care, uh, is something that I think we probably would like to have, would prefer to have, coming from humans, not machines that look like humans. So I think that there are a lot of job categories which I think have got a, uh, got a, a long and healthy life ahead of them. A couple of countervailing factors, and one I'm going to talk about is what's called the, the dependency ratio. And if you haven't heard this term, uh, I'll just give you a really quick, uh, quick tutorial. It's the ratio of the number, we call them dependent people, young people and old people, divided by the number of people who are doing work. And uh, that's the, the formula there. And low is good, right? It means that there's a lot of working people to help the people who need to be helped. Uh, and if it's high, it means we need to have more work done per person. We need to have greater productivity within our society. So this graph, I think, is the dependency ratio for Australia. And interesting sort of factors about that, in this period here, uh, a lot of kids were born, that the baby boomers, and so they went into the, into the numerator of this equation, made the dependency ratio high. And then they moved into the workforce, and the dependency ratio came down because they moved into the, new, into the denominator. Uh, and it got to probably as low as it ever would be a few years ago. And then as the, as the boomers retire and they move back up into the numerator, that number's going to get bigger. So that means then we've got more people in our society need to be looked after, cared for, 
uh, than relative to the number of people who can do the work. So that argues that perhaps there's going to be an increasing number of jobs to look after uh, this aged cohort. And it looks like the dependency ratio will probably settle out long term at uh, a high number. So last slide. The guys who wrote the original report that talked about 47% of jobs disappearing in the next few decades, have up, one of them anyway has produced a new report, uh, just came out a few weeks ago, it's called The Future of Skills. And it's much more rosy than the previous one. They looked more deeply at the problem, they considered other trends in society besides just looking at could an automation system do this job. Uh, and you know, they're looking at climate change, urbanization, aging infrastructure in our societies, not just aging people, aging infrastructure. And though they came up with seven out of 10 jobs, we actually don't know what's gonna happen. Some are gonna go up and some are gonna go down. So uh, much more optimistic than it was. Thank you.